into on financing your startup. Today's presentation by Leo Lam is what angel investors look for. Last week's presentation and all of our other presentations can be found on UW um, Commotion's YouTube channel on the Fundamentals for Startup playlist. Uh, next week, we have Chris Hunley talking about bootstrapping your startup. And then for the full schedule and just for other events that we have, you can visit our website at commotion.uw.edu backslash events. Um, another cool event series that we have coming up is the Seattle Angel Conference, which takes place every Tuesday over at HQ from 6 to 8. Um, the upcoming uh, workshop is a pitch deconstruction workshop led by Javier Soto, Elaine Morfelli, and Yoko Ono. Um, that series is a workshop series where the first eight are educational um, presentations about how one might attract angel funding. And then at the very, very end, you can enter your startup in a pitch competition to earn 150000 or more in investment. Brings us to today's presentation with Leo Lam about what angel investors look for. Um, some uh, fun facts about Leo Lam. He's a serial entrepreneur and angel investor. He's one of the founding LPs of the Swan Venture Fund, an angel investment group in Seattle investing in seed rounds of early stage companies. Is it Folio? Is that the name of it? Folio, his consulting business, has helped early stage companies structure deals and raise over $5 million in the past two years through both crowdfunding and angel channels. His current portfolio includes nine startups from a variety of industries. He's currently the CEO of Weavy. Um, Weavy, <laughs> um, which is a high-end consumer products company, and he's on the board of Hero Clips, a two-year-old startup with two successful rounds of fundraising. Leo received his PhD in electrical engineering from the UW, and he's also a graduate from the Foster School of Business. Thank you, Leo. Hi. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. It's a lot of people. Thanks to I see that one's the close-up. So uh, Spokane and anyone on YouTube. Thanks for coming. Uh, I am a weirdo, but out of all these characters uh, up there, the, the, mo the best one is three times Husky, so master PhD faculty, so it, it's pretty cool. Um, and you would wish that the, the talk is called What Do Angels Look Like? And they look like that. But it's, uh, it's actually one of my fashion photography stuff, and that's actually how I made my money when I was in graduate school. Um, but regardless, we're going to do what do angels investors look for. Now, uh, this is the flow today. I'm going to talk about all those, all of those. And I always want to get things more, to be a little bit more interactive. And because I only have half an hour, there's actually a lot of things within angel investments uh, that can, <laughs> you know, by itself could be an hour or two hours of a talk. So I'll go through a lot of outlines. I'll draw in to a little bit more on things you can do at the end to, to prepare and uh, uh, get some angel funding or find them, okay? But without knowing your customers, your angel investors who will buy your idea, there's no way you can pitch to them, right? If you, are, if you wanna sell anything, you need to know your customers. If you want to sell your ideas, you need to know your investors. And then I'll talk a little bit about the current trends of seed money uh, climate. Uh, the bad news is it's not that good, but um, that means there are things you can do to increase your chance of getting that kind of funding. Sounds good? And before I start, I want to know if there are any specific questions that uh, you would like me to address a little bit more Within, within this talk. I can address it as I go, and then we can also, you know, stop me whenever, okay? Nothing else? All right. So uh, you see a shark? That's what angel investors are. Uh, we are not angels, we are investors. And what angel investors really are is actually classified as a regulation D uh, in, uh, in IRS or SEC rules. It means we are accredited investors. We are allowed to invest in private equity without much restrictions, and the companies won't run foul of any SEC rules. It only means that we make a certain amount of money uh, every year, plus or, or or we have a net worth of over one million dollars uh, outside of the house of residence. So that's about it. Now we don't. We're not one percenter. We're only two percenters. So there are more of us out there than you can find. 
And you would notice this shark is smiling. So we are not all sharky and no smileys. We do empathize sometimes. Uh, but we are shark first, smiling second. And today, I'm not, gonna, I'm not really going to hold that much back. And I'm not, I'm not known for uh, putting, put it, making things uh, sugar-coated, et cetera. So I'll give you as is. Another caveat is that I'm only one of thousands of angel investors around the country. There are, in this forum, angel investments, there, is a lot, there are a lot of personalities. I'm only one of them. I think I'm the nicer ones. Uh, and, but there are, pretty, they, there are some pretty cutthroat people. There are a lot of opinions. So as a scientist, by training, I will give it, I'll give you things that are based on data, not based on personality. I will let you deal with personalities when you meet them, OK? So there's one exception to this rule of, uh, in Regulation D is if you belong to an angel group, you are, you are uh, an accredited investor. So they, you can take money from those people too, even if they don't strictly follow Regulation D. So why do most angels become angel investors? Because they, we are investors. We want to make money out of more money. So uh, at the end, you would, you would see I have a three-word thing, which is interesting that you would look forward to. So what we normally do is we want to diversify our portfolio. You know, people invest in stock, mutual funds, T-bonds, blah, 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 blah. And just don't do derivatives, and you all know why. But Ultimately, we want to make money. So keep that in mind. We are here to make money. But of course, uh, we are also kind of nice. And not many investors out there, in fact, the general population is not very risk taking. And so angel investors tend to be more of a, of, of a risk taker. And you can assume that is the case. Another thing is a lot of us are, you know, technologists ourselves, doctors who want to see things moving and they are practicing and they don't have time to develop anything. So, you know, people we are interested in developing new things, uh, seeing, getting, become part of something new and solve some big problems. And this is a lot smaller intentionally in the font. We do have some altruism. I, 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 I used to teach here. I love my kids here. So uh, I do like to see people success be becoming successful. But we, the, the key is we want to save the world, but we also want to make money at the same time. We don't want to just save the world and, oh, <laughs> let's not do that. Now, so who, who are we? The good news is it's becoming a little bit more diverse. And this is from the 2017 data. And if you want more detailed angel information, the best place to look for is the uh, uh, Angel Capital Association. There's also an Angel Research Institute in Oregon that come out with a HALO report every year. HALO is H-A-L-O. The 2018 numbers haven't come out yet, but the 2017 numbers are looking uh, more diverse. And because more women are joining uh, the angel groups, the numbers are getting better. There is now even an, a, a women-focused angel groups in Seattle. Uh, the raise part is sad, yes. But anyway, um, I beat the median age by about three years. Uh, no, oh, wait, I'm not that old. Uh, eight years. I beat that median age by eight years. But generally, we, uh, angel investors are older, um, mostly in the 50s. And this is because their background mostly are successful executives. A lot of Microsoft uh, former executives are angel investors. There's a group in Bellevue called TAGS that are pretty much all, uh, also all Indian uh, angel <laughs> investors from Microsoft. Go to those meetings, they have great food. Uh, a lot of bankers, former financial people, um, we have uh, a good friend of mine is, is a former you know, head, this buck stopped with him, of, a, of a, one of the largest commercial banks in the world. You know, and so th those are the people that you will be dealing with. And if you are looking at that and just like, well, okay, 
what that tells you is that these people have been successful before, somehow, except the last part, the, the silver spoon ones. Those are the tiny parts, uh, and we let them waste their money. But anyway, what is, angel, what is the most valuable thing about angel investors, for a, especially for an early, early startup, is the connection and the expertise. We help. We don't really, most of the time, we, don't, we are not passive investors. Uh, and you do want to get to the right person with the right skills who can give you money and help you. Uh, you may be surprised to know that in Seattle, a lot of angel investors, almost, uh, not, not a lot of them, but enough of them end up working for the company they invested in. Uh, you know, they take a little salary because they already put their money in, so why are they paying themselves, right? But they, they, would, they end up working for it because they are passionate about it, they can help, they have done it before, uh, another friend of mine, a former managing director for Weyerhaeuser, he's now working with one of the companies that we both invested in. So we're here to shark and to smile and to help. So what do we want? ROI, ROI, ROI. When do we want it? Now. Okay, it's, it's the same. Uh, slogan everywhere we yell. So remember, we care about this. But this is something that we'll talk about later on what you can do to go through, to, to pitch to us that you have this. And also, we are looking, absolutely looking for good people. Anyone who has done it for long enough would know that bad people would tank anything. It does not matter uh, what it is what segment it is, how they have tried to execute. If the people have no integrity, they lie to each other, they fight each other, you're screwed, regardless. We have never, almost never seen a case where a broken team could make things work. And we have replaced people in teams before. I have seen it twice firsthand. I have helped done one. Uh, and so we look for good people, we like good people, so be nice. And we like some satisfaction on seeing things go to market. We are so happy every time when we see updates. Even if you miss it a little, we know we set you guys lofty goals. Okay, you miss a little, but you're in 10 more shops, you're in, you sold a thousand more units of $10 million, great. So we want those satisfactions and we do like some bragging rights. I invested in, I don't know, Clarisonic. It just got sold for $900 billion. I, I made that number up. But uh, great, right? So what do we need? And what I'm showing you here are, based on research, what the best practices for angel investors are. So you know what we need to do to get to what we want, which is a return of about 20 plus percent IRR a year. So. What we're looking for in companies are uh, this return is about 10 times of our investment, which means 10 times your, your post money valuation in, ten, in, in five years, but 10 exits. You're all probably very good at math. And if you do it, compound interest in re reverse, that's about 58.5%. That is heck of a shark alone, isn't it? Now, but of course, the, the the nature is different. Bank would never loan to startups like this. Uh, and so obviously we look for different things. And what we are aiming for is we need to invest in close to 10 uh, investments, um, one off. So 10 investments in about two to three years time frame, get a return roughly in about five to six years because the exit timing is getting longer and longer because of the uncertainty in the market. Uh, we do get involved. We need to get involved with the companies. We want to make sure things are going on track, especially for newer entrepreneurs with not that much gray hair in the team. Uh, we get involved. The exit is taking longer. It is high risk investment. And if you have done some finance class, if I want secure investments, I would never get 20% return. If I want secure investment, I'll put all my money in your T-notes, right? Uh, treasury bonds, supposedly risk-free. Uh, 
and it returns 46%, depends on the bond. But because we're taking higher risk, we, we should be looking for more. And so, uh, you know, at the minimum, most, most angels invest per deal about $25,000. So 10 deals, 25,000. That's, oh, so sorry, 250,000, which is not, not chump change, right, for most people. And remember, angel investors' boundary is not that high if you look at that number. 250,000 could be uh, an angel investor's full year salary or uh, one quarter of his net worth outside of the home, right? So that's actually a small, not a small change. Now, this is what's happening right now since 2016, unfortunately. Uh, uncertainty, because things, <laughs> we open the news every day and we have no idea what's going to happen these days. And what the market doesn't like is uncertainty. When we have so much uncertainty for at least, you know, probably quite a few more years to go, right now, people's risk tolerance has gone down. And so people are going back to more traditional, safer investments. And seed money funding has dropped four years in a row. And the more uh, acute drops have been in the past two years. So what's interesting, though, is the seat deal size has increased. But if you, you it's, that sounds good, right? So you can raise more money. Right? You can, it, sounds like, it sounds that way. But if you look into the data, which you will read in the HALO report, et cetera, et cetera, is that people investing later in terms of where the company's uh, progress is. If you are a pre-revenue company, it's really, really hard to raise money right now. So the key to go through, get through screening round these days is to have revenue. Doesn't matter if it's small or big, or if you have other leverages, which is which could be in you know, SBIR, SDTR. You have grants that are non-dilutive. That would be great. So what does it mean? It means more, more starts up are competing for less money per deal. Per deal, we're talking about right now, I think per deal the median is about six hundred thousand dollars. So you can, you can expect roughly that amount. We need to see lower risk or see more. So we need to have more confidence in your, execute, in your execution that we believe that your experience or your skills would mitigate the risk. So regardless, we're looking for a, a lower risk profile. What that really means for each angel is a little different. But revenue, if you have revenue, that's a sure sign that there's a market acceptance of your product. And that's get you past just about any screening round, if you're reasonable and nice. And you will be looking at giving investors more beneficial terms, convertible notes, those uh, safe notes, et cetera. Those are not that friendly to investors. And so you will be looking at more like preferred participating stock, and there are other things we need to do. So this sign is exactly uh, what we need to see. We want to turn away the fear. You want to convince me to move away the fear and build trust. The second part is, a, is called believable <laughs> value proposition. That part is what I do a lot in my consulting, and that's, I've done that for Microsoft, eBay, and all the startup companies. And what I'm talking about is, as a scientist, we like to talk about, oh my god, my, my result is 20% better than uh, what's out there. I can build this, and it will be totally world-changing. It costs 600 times more. OK. So what what I'm doing, what, I, what you guys need to realize here is that instead of, you need to, instead of talking about these features improvements, you need to start thinking about what that feature improvement means in the real world. How does it make things go faster? If you save people time, that's value. It's, it's better. Oh, it works 30% better. 
and that translates to, oh, 20% less recurrence of certain disease. How much is that worth? You need to start thinking about all these features improvements in terms of dollar benefits. And that's what I mean by a believable value proposition. And we'll, we'll draw into that a little bit on things you can do. So this is where we change gear into things you can do. I call it KISPRI's presentation, and it is not what you're thinking about. And we'll talk about all five of those. So this is just the topics. This is your KISS presentation. You need to answer two major questions. Why you're so awesome? And why should I trust you? Why should I take the risk on you, not the next person? Because you're now competing with more entrepreneurs out there, some of whom probably have done it before, and you're competing with them, okay? KISS is keep it simple, scientists. Many of you are technologists here, I believe. You need to remember in your audience, your angel investor audience, especially if you go to a group, most of them are not your domain experts. If you start using jargons, if you start using, if you, you never know. Some of them could be a fantastic trucking executives, big money, bicycles executive, $50 billion a year, wow. But they would have no clue about your super duper processor, interconnects, whatever you're making. So you need, to, you need to make sure you're not presenting a paper, but you're presenting the benefits of what you're doing. Why is better? So do this. Identify how much the pain is worth in the world. I'm not saying how painful it is. I specifically said how much it's worth. If it costs a company $2 million a year to solve certain problems, you can solve it better, and they only need to pay a $1 million. Are they going to buy it? Yeah, right? Now state your solution, and I always say the painkillers and vitamins analogy. Painkillers are great, kills your pain. That's worth a lot. Vitamins, eh, you probably don't need it. But it would be good to have. Good to have normally is not good enough for, for high growth investment. Unless you have done it before and you have grown crazy nonsense products forever. And th that happens a lot in, in the beauty industry. So uh, it works really well. Now, once you have your solution, you need, to, you need to show the tangible value of why, what, how much that solution is worth. You need to put a dollar signs to it. And how to do that depends on what you're doing. But for example, in software, most of the time is enhancing workflow, increasing efficiency, reducing liability, increasing compliance. All of those come with a cost. If you can do it better, you can reduce that cost, you can table it, you can put it in your Excel spreadsheets, multiply by the how many people would get uh, uh, affected, that's your value, okay? And people would pay for that. You need to know your competition, what's out there. Are you really better? You might be better, but if you're a lot more expensive, you may not have a business. Now, this is my own pet peeve. Know your bottom-up market size. What I mean by that is how, can, how many people can you get to? I'm starting a new bicycle shop. The market size of the bicycle industry is $50 billion. I'm going to get 0.001% of that market. Is that believable? I don't have a crystal ball. Where did I pull out that 0.001%? You can't do that. But I can say, hey, I'm going to start a shop in Green Lake. There will be 2,000 people walking by in front of the door. I know there are how many, I know how many bicyclists are cycling around there or own a bicycle there that needs service or will buy a bicycle. That's how you build a bottom-up market size. That is believable. Or based on your, your other execution, okay, the wholesale, the, the distributor for medical device that I'm going to use has 300 customers. They will be able to touch 
50 in the first five months. So my achievable market size in the first five months is X. Okay, that's how you build a bottom-up market size. And of course, have ideas how to reach that market. This is what angels investors always want to see. And I always advise adding an extra slide at the end about what's in it for you. Because remember, we are sharks, smiley sharks. We want to know what's in it for us. You need to know whether you'll be purchased, most likely. That's the best scenario. Um, IPOs, which is unlikely, uh, but it does happen. It just generally takes forever. Um, if you ask any angel investors, just say DocuSign, and they will start crying. So uh, it did exit beautifully, but it took 15 years. So uh, what that is good, uh, what with that slide, your investors would understand that, oh, you are taking care of us too because it's not all about you. You want our money, you have to be nice to us. So this is one thing that I can say for just about all investors, is we understand when you walk in here, you're not perfect, you are a startup, you don't have everything, all the ducks lined up, you don't have a crystal ball, you make the best guesses. And if you're smart, you have a PhD at the end of your name, they assume you're smart and then use it and, and just show why. Justify everything you say. Use data that is not arguable. For example, um, I know I'm running a little bit over. Um, for example, with the company that I helped raise money, when they were selling five units per store per day, when I built the financials for them as a projection, I used an assumption of 0.5 unit per store per day. And all of the investors are like, okay, you're using one-tenth of your current data set to build a projection. That's got to be believable. So even if you fail 90%, you would still be close to what you were before, right? So that's the kind of convincing you need to do to make it so that they believe what you say and they can't argue with you. And trust me, they love to argue. <laughs> Benefit-based justification. Are you better, faster, or cheaper? You have to be at least one of them to be a business. Two of them, you have a good business. Three of them, you have a slam dunk. <laughs> a sign of value, I keep talking about that. And for scaling, you have to be reasonable. What I mean by reasonable is you have limited resources, you're not going to be able to reach everyone very quickly. You have to say, we have staff of five, we have two salesperson, they can call 10 people a day, the conversion rate is 6%. That becomes reasonable. And then as we grow our revenue based on those assumptions, we can reach X people by X, and then it will have a X, Y, effect, an avalanche effect, and it would, it would start getting media coverage, then we'll grow, grow more quickly. That kind of stuff, okay? That makes it reasonable. Don't do any of those, especially the first one. We have, in fact, caught some people in a lie. Uh, the, the only next word that that person heard was next. Okay? Do not do that. Don't make things up. Uh, and we will get X percent of the market, I talked about it. No one can say that, un unless you are a psychic, which is nonsense, okay? The last line is interesting. Who can tell me where that line came from? Nobody can, because it came from the Deepak Chopra bullshit generator. <laughs> oh, you can make up these lines anytime. It's very easy. So. The point is, don't bullshit us. At some point, we'll find out. And by the time you get to you know, due diligence, we will find out everything. It, remember the list of people that are angel investors? Someone will find something. And it's not a big world. We talk. We, we talk to each other quite a bit, okay? So last line is not something profound. It's BS. So be resourceful. Now, 
Remember, you're paying 58% plus interest raising angel investments. Don't raise if you don't need to. Bootstrap. Grants, loans, you guys all know how to write grants, probably. Uh, SBR, STR, SDTR, leverage them as much as you can. The last one is called Gangplank Loan, which I have used before. Gangplank Loan is called your credit card. The, and uh, in the famous word of, what's, huh, what's his name? Uh, Jeff Hussey, he was the founder of uh, a gigantic networking company in, in Washington State. He used Gangplank Loan to pay his employees when he had cash flow problem in the beginning. Gangplank loans are not so bad if you think about it, because if you have good credits, you can write yourself a cash advance check and th those offers come all the time, right? 4%, 4% versus 58%. If you know you can make the money back within the time frame they, time frame they give you, a lot of them these days are very generous, like 18, 24 months. For 4%, I would buy a car with it. It's not bad, right? So you've got to be resourceful and figure out what resources you have. And if you're a student, start building up your credits any way you can. Go to thepointsguy.com, something, figure out how to build credits. It's a great thing. Crowdfunding. This is a long topic that I can talk for five hours. Um, Cumulatively, I've raised about two and a half million dollars on, on uh, uh, Kickstarter. And uh, what's the other one? Indiegogo, Indiegogo. thank you. Huh. Blanking. Uh, it's doable, it works better for consumer products. Try partnership, see if there are anyone who would partner with you and help you front development costs. This is a big thing for a lot of angel investors. Not quite for me, because if you're if you a brilliant younger person, you probably don't have a lot of money yourself unless you have the silver spoon. Well, in that case, you don't need us. But if, you're, if you are a career professional, put some of your own money in it. Doesn't matter how much it is, 10 grand, five grand. Say you have skin in the game, so you're not using our money and we take all the risk and you just execute, right? Okay? Does it die? There. Know your audience. Know your angel investors. Know the group that you're, you're, you're pitching to. What do they normally like? Look up who passed in the past. These are things that um, when, I was just a, uh, uh, when I was a student as a super geek, I didn't like doing I thought, oh, no, I'm so brilliant. And, and why do I need to? I'm better than all of them. Learn your audience. In fact, because other people are presenting, learn your enemies, because they are competing for the same dollar you are. See what, who succeeded, pretty much copy exactly, which is the Intel process of making things successful. Copy them. Know what they do. Learn how to be charming, et cetera, et cetera. One interesting thing is when you pitch, some older school investors would like you to dress up. Don't let them dress better than you. Uh, to me, I'm old school, I'm, I'm British, so it's just kind of polite. Uh, don't show up in your sweatshirts, please. I don't care much, but there are, you know, you know this, the, the, the age group back there, they care. Now. Deal terms, because money is tougher right now, the easiest deal terms are the terms that are more friendly to investors. If you want money fast, these are the terms you want to do. You would need to be a C-Core, and being a C-Core has multiple tax advantage for the investors. There's a, lot, a, a little bit more paperwork for you guys, but uh, it's better for investors because we get tax credits, uh, not tax exemption when you exit, uh, for losses, we can write it off, and uh, plus other benefits, and we don't get double taxed. So, and also the uh, pre-money valuation, don't throw a money, uh, don't throw a number there that you read somewhere. Find a reason for your valuation. If you're pre-money and you tell me you're worth $4 million, you're out the door before I even talk to you, okay? 
So we have, we have done that many times because we just don't see the return. And remember, ROI, ROI, ROI. We want it now, <laughs> all right? And mo a lot of people are talking about you know, convertible notes, uh, safe notes, et cetera. Those are generally not investor-friendly instruments. Uh, more seasoned investors that I know of, probably, we probably haven't even done one non preferred stock deal in our fund. And uh, more than 60% of the deals are still done with preferred stock, okay? And kiss notes and stuff, those actually doesn't even, those are in single digits in terms of percentage, but those are probably in the Bay Area. And all of these other extra stuff, you can read up on what those are. The slide will be available to you guys, so read up on those. I don't want to go into it because we don't have time and I'm a lawyer and don't play one on TV. There's another way to do angel investment or get angel investors, is offer a deal that is not a stock deal, but a revenue loan. If you know you're gonna get some revenue in quickly enough, you can say, hey, I will give you 18% a year. Uh, oh, well, sorry, nope, take that back. I will, I will give you X percent of our revenue as it comes in up to two times what you loan me. If you, if you do the math, if you pay back two times in two, three years, that's our goal. That meets our goal, and that's okay. So the, I, there is no fixed interest in that case. You're taking a loan based on future revenue promises. But most of the time, in order to get those stuff, we really need to trust you know that revenue is already there and it's just going to grow. Team. This, Warren Buffett said it best. You, how he hires people, he needs to, to, she, she needs to be smart, driven, and has integrity. But without the last one, the first two don't matter. The, so, I start with one and then the other one and end with one. If you are a student, your credibility to investors are typically zero. Uh, you would want to hire or work with mentors who are credible and Commotion has a lot of resources to connect you with those people. Work with them, get them to be advisors, get them to be on your board of directors, something. The rest are probably quite obvious. Um, you do want to set up some level of governance for check and balances. And if you offer your investors a board seat, if they invest in a certain amount, they can check on you and they have fiduciary uh, responsibility a little bit on your behavior and they can check on uh, enthusiasm drive, et cetera, et cetera. And you guys have all have enough intelligence if you're sitting in this room. <clears throat> so where do you find us? Uh, online, offline, way preferred networking. When I was younger, I did not know this. And um, when I was in my 20s, I really thought, oh, what I know is enough. It's not. You need to go meet people. If you're shy, well, talk to a language coach, take some acting classes. I did, I actually took acting classes. But also because I started off as an opera singer. I am weird. I have the most nonlinear career path anyone you will ever hear. Um, so, but we get to know people. One lead to another, I can tell you I'm only here today because a few people picked me up, not because I'm that brilliant, okay? Um, there are angel groups, and the lists are down there. There are more on, this, this is a non-exhaustive list. Angel groups are a group of interesting animals, and they are rowdy, they're kind of crazy, they're kind of fun, uh, they're opinionated, and, but if you follow the framework I gave you, justify everything, de-risk, you would at least get past the screening round. So, summary, we are angel investors, we're investors first, 
angel way second. We are no angel. I don't think any one of us can claim to be an angel anyway. No nurses, as far as I know. And, but we offer more than capital. We offer expertise, guidance. We are hands-on. Most of us are hands-on, and you do want the hands-on. Now, this is the one-line summary of what we're looking for. We want high growth with a high exit potential. If there's no exit, we don't care. If you, don't, if you plan on running your company forever, we don't, we don't care. We, don't, we want to see a liquidity event. Okay. And know what you need, know what you want, but empathize with ours. That way, I call it emp empathy selling. It works all the, almost all the time. Sell me a pen, you know, that, that kind of idea. If you know the movie reference. Now, of note again, the cap cost of capital is very high. It's very expensive money. So if you, are, um, if you don't need to raise, don't. I have bootstrapped twice, and it works way better because I, be, I was the sole owner. All right? Fundraising also takes forever. It's not easy. It takes, right now, I think the median has gone from six months to eight months. It takes a long time. It takes time away from you building your company or building your product, et cetera, et cetera. All right, and here's the three word. Cash money millionaire and save the world once in a while. All right, so that's all I have today for now. Yes? So we have a question to kick us off. Great. Uh, what research tools do angel investors use to survey the seed funding, angel investing, M&A landscape? Pitch book, crunch base? Yeah, so the, do I need to repeat that or do they have nope, they, they got, got it? it? Okay. Thank you. So the, yeah, we use uh, Crunchbase, CB Insights, we subscribe to PwC, we subscribe to, uh, well, I subscribe to McKinsey Reports. Uh, Halo Report is a great guidepost. Granted, since we are scientists, I can tell you that the data gathering of these type of reports, uh, give it plus and minus a certain percent. These are not exact science. But yeah, those are the places we go to. Yes. Uh, let, let's get the mic so uh, the other side can hear. You mentioned uh, reasonable valuation. Mm -hmm. um, what techniques do you use for pre-revenue company uh -huh. valuation? There are multiple ways to do it. Uh, comparables is one. So compare what has gone through the deal, deal flow is one that has successfully raised money. Another way to do it is a more financially focused method is use your uh, money projection and effectively do a reverse net present value. There are multiple valuation methods out there and um, it depends on who you talk to. I am more of a number person, scientist. I like to work with data. I like to build the uh, forecast and then discount it back. By the way, when you use that kind of discounting method to get to your valuation, the discount rate we use is 58 or 71 percent. Really high because that's our risk rate. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you uh, speak a little bit more towards the difference between pro proving market acceptance and product market fit um, as you? Um, show a, the case of a profitable business or sure does that make sense? yeah uh, the easiest way to show market acceptance is money have are people buying it that's number one and uh, that's where also crowdfunding comes in really beautifully because crowdfunding is actually a uh, pre-order people actually give you money you build something you deliver right that's also a sign of acceptance. If you're talking about more of a technology, uh, do you have a, a specific field you're thinking about? Uh, CPG. CPG, oh, it's consumer products, yeah. okay. Consumer products is revenue. You can see that people buy it. Uh, most of the time with consumer products company, like the one uh, Heroclip, the one that I'm on the board for, they raised, gosh, 
almost a million dollars on uh, Kickstarter. And they delivered, and people started buying stuff through their website who are Kickstarter backers. That's a market acceptance. Uh, and then they got into REI. REI starts selling them, market acceptance. Um, beauty products, people use it, people buy it, you get on TV, product acceptance. But the best thing always with any field is someone bought it. Or someone paid you some money to start doing something. That works too, for more tacky stuff. Does that help? Thank you, thank you, Leo, for that presentation. Um, based on your prior history of uh -huh. nonlinear career development, uh -huh. I'm guessing you have some interesting stories. A lot. Do you have a, maybe like a success story and a, maybe a or problematic failure or something you <laughs> want to share with us? Uh, well, so success stories are, are you know, I guess, the, 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 the gist of your question is, what, what did I learn from it, right? The gist of the question, uh, the gist of the answer is good people that you can trust, you can work with, and this applies both to success and failures. Almost all of my failures were related to people. Um, you know, not trustworthy, lied. Um, and successes is a little bit of risk taking, I would say I'm a much bigger risk taker than most people I know. Um, and I, I am, I'm, I'm extremely curious. I mean, I, I am a scientist, hard, hard scientist by training. I work on lithium ion batteries by training for my PhD. And you know, I still review for two journals, but I am, uh, I am a business person at heart and an aspiring artist that makes money. But um, I'm not that good of an artist. I somehow just make money. Um, the, the key there is, is be very curious. Um, another thing um, is that I keep on changing. I'm not the same person I was two years ago. I'm not the same person, I, definitely not the same person I was when I was in my 20s, nowhere close. Um, and somebody said this, uh, you want to have strong opinions loosely held. As data, new data shows up that tells you that your old belief was wrong, change it. But when you believe it, believe it, <laughs> for now. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks, Leo, for the presentation. Question is, what's the angel industry? And I know you're representing a subset. <laughs> yep. uh, what's your view on part-time co-founders or part-time founders? Ha. Huh. For investors, that's generally not a good idea. But if that's the case, you would want to ask them, well, I need, I need to pay bills. I mean, you can't just shut down, like what's happening right now for 800,000 people. You can't just shut down. So you, you can say within, within, your, um, within your financial projection, put in a salary that you can live on. Uh, we are not unreasonable. I mean, we are a shark, but we smile, right? And if you, put, if you, are, if you have a PhD and, or you're a faculty or you're a student, you may get a different number that we would consider reasonable. But if you're a faculty um, or research scientist, if you put 100,000 in there, no one's going to blink. Well, someone will blink, but generally we would say, OK, if your value proposition way exceed what we pay you, fine. Because you're, you're generally going to make money out of selling the, the, the company. You will be rewarded later with a huge, much bigger chunk if you're successful then this salary, if this salary is not even going to be a, a percentage point of what you're going to get. Um, but part-time founders also make things move a lot more slowly. And so for students here that I have seen and gone out there and become successful, they quit. They either quit the program. I have, I have worked with a PhD candidate in physics, uh, quit, started a kitchen appliance company, raised $2 million. 
it, it, and uh, well, sadly now it's closed. But uh, you know, it was a fun run for for quite a while, and he can now go back to school and finish his PhD if he wants to. But for us, we don't like to see part time because that means our money is not working full time for us, right? So. Leo, so what is your advice for uh, capital intensive projects that? kind of need the funding to test the market so you don't have any pre-revenue? Grants. Grants, okay. So the, we uh, almost invested in another UW company called Blue Haptics. Uh, they get funded by AOA, so great. Um, for some reason, our fund passed on it. But regardless, the, um, they, have, they are on phase two, they are on multiple SBIR phase one, phase two. Do that. Use grants, because these are non-dilutive. And by the way, those grants give us confidence, because it doesn't dilute us, it's free money. And at the same time, some experts in those grant reviewing committees said this is viable. That, that's a lot of, that's uh, uh, actually answered the other question too, is product accep acceptance. It's accepted. Does that help? If you bootstrap, mm -hmm. uh, you still want to offer something to early employees. Yes. Um, would you still recommend like creating a C corp and you know, giving them equity so that someday when you exit, they can still benefit from it? Be very careful with that. Um, if you could pay cash, if you could pay cash uh, and meet all the law requirements. If you can't and if you have to give them, uh, if you want to give them some equity, uh, there is a way to identify how much you probably want to give them, and it's called the slicing pie method. Slicing pie is a book, and it's one of the most rational, logical, reasonable way to carve up a company to pay somebody with future value. So that's a great book to go for. And whether you want, you do want, if you know you're going to raise money, you want to start as a C core. Not that you can't change from an LLC to a C core. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, you can do that. But the tax implication, your financial implication, goes back 10 years when you change. So it's just going to be a headache. Um, upfront, C core is not that hard to do either. I mean, any competent lawyer would. would could, could get you going. And, and is the slicing pie method, if you were an angel investor and you came in to somebody who said, you know, early on they, they thought they were going to bootstrap and then they realized that they needed to raise money mm -hmm. and they'd done the slicing pie method, would mm -hmm. you be o open to that and say, oh, okay, sure, we can work with that? Yeah, if it's, if it's reasonable. What I mean by reasonable is, let's say someone did, you know, $5,000 worth, of, if, if you have to buy the service, it's $5,000 of work. Uh, and you initially value your company at a million dollars. I'm making these numbers up to make it easy. You gave this person 0.5%. Okay. And this, but the, the, the most important thing is you need to show that this amount of equity you gave out has given you value. And that shows good management. You can, you got, you paid out something, you got something, and based on this something with Investors help you could build something that goes like a hockey stick. Nothing does, but most the the company some companies do. If you can do that, then yes, absolutely. It depends on the justification. If you have the numbers, yeah, this five thousand dollar I paid out in equity actually gave me fifty thousand dollars worth of of value. Great. Does that answer that? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Is there one more question? Yes. So I have a question maybe about um, kind of state of the art and kind of research edge type mm. of companies. What are your thoughts and kind of maybe some differences in investing in those types of companies that maybe they're always kind of doing more research, finding market fit, those types of things? That's where commotion comes in. So commotion would help you I mean, there are more um, resources available to you guys than a private person outside of the university. There's a UW, UW has a fund by itself. I mean, you have 
uh, connections to, to get people to help you identify more of where you should go in terms of your research. And um, the difference, the only difference between academic research and commercial research is that commercial research generally has a ROI justification. We are working on this. We are shrinking the line size at Intel because it would make us X more dollar more money. Academ academia is beautiful because you can just do things for fun <laughs> and for, for the beauty of learning more, right? But once you start to think about, okay, there's a commercial viability for what I'm working on, you need to start justifying the value. But good news is, the moment you do that, grants are available. S uh, SBIR, find partnerships. You may have companies that are looking for differentiating technologies. You don't even need to be, oh, I, I don't need to build a whole thing. You might just build a patent and have Commotion help you license the patent. That works too. So maybe a quick add-on. Yeah. Would you see angel investors investing in a company that is continuing to do kind of research, have research line item in addition to some product that they put Yes, with the caveat is that we, know, we need to know that there is at some point something that can be sold. Thank you. And in a fairly short term. Thank you, Leo. Leo Thank you. Leo. Thanks, McCann. And you too. Thank you.